Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Matt Clifford, and as you've just heard, I've spent the last decade trying to answer one very big question. How can we make the UK the best place in the world to build, scale, and adopt AI? And what I want to try and spend the next 15 minutes doing is persuading you of three things. The first is that answering that question is perhaps the most urgent and important task that we face as a country. The second is that the UK actually does have the foundations to answer that question positively. We can do this and we can win. But the third is that doing so will require a relentless focus on execution and an extraordinary level of ambition. I've been fortunate to spend my career on the front lines of AI, both in the private and in the public sector. Through my company, Entrepreneur First, I've helped to incubate some of the UK's biggest AI success stories, companies like Tractable, Clio, Magic Pony Technology, and in the public sector, I've been lucky to play some role in building uh, the UK's state capacity to where it is today, partly as the chair of the Events Research and Invention Agency, ARIA, which you've heard about, but also as part of the team that last year helped to set up the UK AI Safety Institute uh, and as one of the uh, co-Sherpas for the AI Safety Summit, which you also just heard about, uh, which we held at Bletchley Park last year. What I've taken from these experiences is that you've already heard from, from Tony and others, AI is the transformational technology of our time. And if we get it right, it will unlock extraordinary benefits for the UK and its people and for the world. We all know that the UK has been through a decade of economic stagnation. I believe that AI is one of the best levers we have to reverse that and to usher in a new period of growth. It also has the opportunity to transform public services. Imagine a world where your elderly relative's AI NHS assistant pre-identifies that the risk of her falling and suffering a debilitating injury has increased. And behind the scenes, that AI assistant coordinates with other NHS AI assistants at the GP, at the hospital, in social care, to pre-plan your relative's care and intervene early. Imagine a world where a startup owner is able to uh, pre-apply uh, pre for R&D tax credits using information that the AI assistant already has. In fact, the AI assistant is able to identify the full range of financing options uh, available. Also, and I think this is an underrated one, AI has the opportunity to massively amplify the UK's place in the world. The next decade is going to see unprecedented adoption of AI all across the world. And the question that needs to be answered is, what flavor of AI and whose values will that embody? That is up for grabs. And the UK is one of a handful of countries well-placed to be the answer, to be one of the AI world's AI superpowers. But to understand the magnitude of both the opportunity but also the task ahead, it's worth taking a brief step back in time. In many ways, ChatGPT's release in November of 2022 was the moment that AI uh, rocketed up the agenda for, for policymakers uh, and politicians. But it's very important, I think, to see the ChatGPT moment as the culmination of a decade-long trend, not as a snapshot moment in time. My introduction to AI was back in 2012. An entrepreneur came into my office with a printout of a rather dry-looking academic paper, this one. Um, but he was breathless with excitement. He said, this is going to change everything. And he was right. Fortunately, I believed him. We funded him Entrepreneur First, and he went on to build one of the UK's AI unicorns, Tractable. But the reason I'm showing you this paper, and don't worry, we're not going to go through the abstract in, in great detail, is that in many ways, this paper ignited the revolution that we saw over the last uh, decade. It's often called AlexNet. Uh, this paper, named after Alex, uh, in the top left-hand corner. And this paper was a breakthrough in image recognition tasks, which has been a long-standing challenge in AI. What AlexNet did was not just beat existing benchmarks by a little. It was the AI equivalent of someone turning up at the Olympics and running the 100 meters in seven seconds. But what mattered more was not just what they did, but how they did it. The how is what would spark the enormous investment that we've seen over the last 12 years. So what was the how? Well, two things. First, the architecture they used, uh, deep neural networks. This was uh, an old idea, but we finally had the ability to make them viable. And what you'll see is that all the AI tools that we use today kind of use this type of, uh, of, of architecture. But the really important thing is, why had they suddenly become viable despite being an old idea? 
Well, really because of what we today call compute, or computational power. And this is the main reason I'm giving this history lesson, because what sparked this revolution is also what we're going to need to think about as we look forward. This paper was possible because we had, uh, were able to use a previously obscure kind of semiconductor chip called the GPU, made by a tiny obscure company called NVIDIA, which you might have seen on Tony's chart earlier as a $3 trillion company today. If you'd invested in NVIDIA uh, at the time, then you, know, you probably would be on an island uh, rather than sitting here today. Now, what's, what's exciting about this is that it unlocked a decade of breakthroughs. Many of them here in London, thanks to the genius of Dem Sasabis, who you're about to hear from, and his team at DeepMind. Um, using these architectures and using this huge amount of compute, you had the ability to win uh, computer games from scratch, one of the famous uh, DeepMind demos. Then most famously of all, you could beat uh, the world's best Go players uh, using a, a, deep, uh, a deep learning model, uh, a, a task that at the time people thought was decades away. And then in 2017, also out of Google, uh, this novel architecture called the Transformer. Now again, I'm not going to go into detail, but why am I telling you this? Because the exciting thing about the Transformer is that they have the ability to absorb almost unlimited amounts of compute and of data. And when I say almost unlimited amounts, I really do think we've put this to the test. The present of AI is all about scale. And this is going to be crucial as we think about what it will take for Britain to win. This chart behind you, behind me rather, shows uh, the progress of the amount of compute we've invested in these models over time. On the bottom, you have the progress of time. On up the side, you have how much computational power was used to power these models. Now, this is a log chart, which we sadly all got used to during COVID. Every time you move up one rung, that's a tenfold increase in compute. So when I said the exciting thing about AlexNet in 2012 was how much compute it used, this is AlexNet here. Demis's latest models up here use 100 million times at least more computational power, 100 million times in a decade. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say there has never been a technology in the history of the world that's seen a 100 million fold increase in investment in a 10 year period. That is the scale of what we're looking at here. But scale isn't just about spending more. Scale has real world impact. Now I've cho chosen a relatively amusing example here, which is the progress in image generation. This is clips from Mid Journey, which many of you might have used. This is just in two years, the impact of scale. The same prompt written in, look at the quality improvement in images, simply from scaling up the size of the models that are being used. Now why is that relevant? I don't think that uh, image generation is necessarily gonna transform the state. But in the same way that scale improves image generation, it improves the capabilities, the real world capabilities of other types of models too. If you think back to GPT-2 that was released in 2019, that was a toy. If you look at GPT-4 today, that is a model that you can, and in fact I do use almost every day, for a wide range of complex cognitive tasks. So the real question today is where does this stop? You know, AI is already powerful today. The things that you've heard already about what AI can do today are important. But we must remember that today's AI is the least capable that AI will ever be. In fact, we should be ready for so much more. All the big AI companies today, Google, Microsoft, etc., are spending tens of billions of dollars a year on compute to keep this chart going for many more orders of magnitude. And the question is, what does that unlock? What will that do? Well, many people believe that in the next decade, it's possible that that will unlock human-like intelligence in these AI models. Are we taking this seriously? Lots of people will tell you at this point that, oh, AI is a bubble. It's all going to come crashing down. It's not ready for prime time. And you know what? They might be right. Anyone who has too much certainty about the future of AI, I think is kidding themselves and probably kidding you. But the idea that there's no probability, no possibility of continued progress, to me, is the craziest belief of all. And in fact, what we really need to do is to recognize that it's become very fashionable, very high status, to assume that the future will be pretty much like the present. It's very, it's almost a cringe thing, as um, the younger people I work with uh, tell me, to imagine that exponential trends can continue. But again, in COVID, we learned that sometimes they do. And ignoring exponential trends can be one of the most damaging and dangerous things you can do as a policymaker. I have to say, it's been very hard to convince uh, politicians that sometimes these lines continue. But I think the UK should prepare for a world where they do. We need to prepare for a world where AI isn't just a tool, but a transformation. 
The reality is AI progress is going to happen. The question is whether the UK will be an AI taker or an AI maker. The good news, though, is that we are very well prepared for this relative to almost any other country in the world outside maybe well, India, <laughs> uh, China, uh, and the US. We do have a vibrant technology ecosystem. We have DeepMind headquartered here. We have companies like Faculty that you've already heard about, Wave, one of the world's leading self-driving car companies, headquartered right here in London. We have an incredible uh, R&D base, world-leading universities, and although I'm a bit biased, um, some of the world's most exciting research funders like ARIA right here in the UK. And we are one of the leaders in state capacity. Thanks to Ian Hogarth and his team at the AI Safety Institute, I believe that the UK probably has the greatest concentration of world-class research talent of any public sector organization in the world. People leaving jobs at DeepMind and OpenAI to join the UK public sector. That's an extraordinary achievement and one that we need to build on. But if we want to really seize the opportunity, then it is going to require an extraordinary level of ambition. And yes, investment. We can't do this for free. There's so much more we need to do if we want to be one of the global winners. We need to be a place where large companies and small come and build and run the data centers that are powering this revolution. It's very exciting to see in the first days of the new government that we're taking this challenge seriously and trying to reverse some of the planning vetoes that meant that we refused investment from some of the biggest companies in the world to build that infrastructure here. We need to be a place where ambitious AI founders can raise the capital and attract the talent they need to grow so they don't have to sell or relocate as soon as they start getting big. We need to be a place where the public sector thinks smartly and strategically about the value of the data that we have, the unique data that we have in this country. Actually, this is one of the areas where the UK can be a true world leader. Data is one of the uh, key fuels that is powering the AI revolution, and the UK is really good at this. But we need to think strategically about how to both create and capture value from that data. And we really need to be a place where our largest organizations in both the private and the public sector adopt AI now, uh, take advantage of today's capabilities to prepare them to take advantage of the capabilities to come. And above all, we need all these things to mutually reinforce. It's not enough to do any one of these things in isolation. We need a coherent strategy that pulls these things together. We need public sector and investment and procurement to fuel our startup and scale up ecosystems. We need the way that we use data in the public sector to encourage adoption in other parts of the economy. We need to have privacy-preserving ways for people to access these unique data sets such that people want to come to the UK to build the AI companies that are going to transform our public services as well as our private lives. This is all possible. In fact, I think it's there for us to take, but it will require us to move with extreme urgency and ambition. This is not something that can wait five years. This is happening now. It's quite possible that in the first term of this government, we will see truly transformational capabilities come out of a deep mind or an open AI and an anthropic. And the question is whether we're ready for it. I do believe that the UK stands poised to be one of the big winners from this revolution. And we can unlock richer, healthier, better lives for all of us. It will require urgency and ambition, but it's there for the taking. We just need to get going. Thank you.